Sometimes our emotions guide us to act in ways that are, in some formal sense, irrational, but in a practical sense are actually beneficial. And one illustration of this is a game from behavioral economics called the ultimatum game. And here's how the ultimatum game works. You have two characters, A and B. And A is given, say, $10 and is asked, how much of this $10 do you want to give to B? Everything from a dollar to all of it. And the rule is that B now has an option. B can either accept the money, so now uh, A keeps whatever money A didn't give away, and B keeps whatever money he or she got, or rejects it. And if B rejects it, nobody gets anything. Now, imagine if there people are perfectly rational. If people are perfectly rational, then the offer A should offer at a minimum $1, and B should accept it, because $1 is better than nothing. If you say, I reject it, nobody gets anything. And remember, this is a one-shot game. You're just playing this once, so you can't really punish people so that they behave better in the future. But interestingly, even for a one-shot game, people don't do this. They often don't accept unfair distributions. They reject them uh, out of spite. So I know if I'm dealing with such a person, I, if I offer him or her $1 or $2, $3, they'd say, no way. And now nobody gets anything. But because of this, because of their irrationality, they get more money from me than a rational per person would get. Um, if I'm dealing with a rational person, I just give a small amount of money. Dealing with an irrational person, I have to deal with more. And in general, there's a sort of social usefulness of irrationality, of being emotional. A rational person is easily exploited because their response to uh, provocations and to um, assault is always going to be measured and appropriate. If I, um, if, you know, if I go up to somebody and I steal a dollar from them and they're perfectly rational and say, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, it's only a dollar. Well, a person with a temper will have an advantage. A person with a temper might, might say, ah, you stole my dollar, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill your whole family. And that's kind of crazy. But when you deal with a crazy person, um, the person has the advantage that you're less likely to want to provoke them. Now, there are matters of degrees here. It gets complicated. If a person is too prone to respond to provocation, then, um, then you, wouldn't, you won't deal with them at all. And so there's a certain optimal level of irrationality. If a person would only accept a distribution if you gave them $7, then, you know, they're a kind of a rotten person to deal with, and then you'll, you'll both be end up worse in the end. But these sort of considerations lead you to realize that responding perfectly rational to a situation is sometimes a disadvantage. Sometimes, particularly in a case where there's the possibility of violence and assault, a reputation for erratic and extreme response can make you better off. Now, it often pays to be irrational, but it can have tragic results. What's adaptive for individuals and what makes sense from an evolutionary point of view may be very bad for people in general. Um, so in their wonderful book on murder, on homicide, Daly and Wilson point out that a major cause of murder is actually offenses to people's honor, insults, curses, petty infractions. And they write, in chronically feuding and warring societies, an essential manly virtue is the capacity for violence. To turn the other cheek is not saintly but stupid or contemptibly weak. Now, what we see here, and it's an idea where I'm introducing at the very end, is that there are cross-cultural differences in the extent to which certain emotions and certain sentiments are expressed. And interestingly here, the importance of reputation and the importance of reputation of, uh, for the capacity for violent reprisal varies from culture to culture. Sociologists describe a culture of honor. And a culture of honor is one where uh, you can rely on the law and you have resources that are easily taken, like herders. And in such a culture, a capacity for excessive violence is uh, essential to keep your, 
your resources. And um, we see these cultures of honors around the world. We and there are Scottish Highlanders, Maasai warriors, Bedouin tribesmen, uh, Western cowboys. And one case in the United States, an area where there's more of a culture of honor, is the American South. They were settled, it was settled by Scottish and Irish herdsmen, and they have less centralized legal control. You don't need a reputation for violence if there's a cop around any, every corner. If um, violence, if, if a tax on you can be addressed properly and quickly by the state, you need it when there's no police to help you. And, um, and what's interesting is that we can see the culture of honor manifests itself in all sorts of psychological differences between individuals within such a culture and outside such a culture. So if in the United States, for instance, um, you find people who are raised within cultures of honors um, have more permissive uh, gun laws, they're more accepting of capital and corporal punishment, they have better attitudes towards the military, they're more forgiving towards crimes of honor, like um, killing somebody in a fight because they insulted somebody you love. And they have higher rates of violence, but only for crimes associated with honor. So they don't have you know, higher rates of violence because they have more violent gang wars or more violent bank robberies, but rather, you know, bar fights, things that are, that are triggered by insults uh, to one's honor. And um, a very cool study, which I'll end with, uh, explored this by Nisbet and Wilson. They did this at University of Michigan, and they tested undergraduates, and they were, from a narrow group, they were all white males, not Hispanic, not Jewish, and some of them uh, came from the south, and some of them came from the north. And they didn't know what the experiment that they were doing was about. But what happened was they get to go to a room, and they fill out some papers and did some tasks. And then they were told to walk across the hall. And, um, and as they were walking across the hall, a graduate student walked by and bumped them with his shoulder kind of nudged them aside, and then said a very rude word to them. Now, afterwards, they were tested, and it turned out that the people from the South were far more upset, energized by this interaction than people of the North. They had greater levels of testosterone, cortisol, stress hormones. They gave a stronger handshake. They gave more violent words when asked to fill in the blank. And this suggests that there are psychologies are different. That in some subtle way, being raised in one culture makes you, among other things, more aggressive when insulted than in another culture. Emotions, although having evolutionary roots, can be calibrated uh, by culture. And more generally, I hope the, the studies we talked about and the evolutionary approach that we took suggest that Emotions like fear and the love we have towards our kin, anger, gratitude, and so on, aren't noise in the system. They aren't some sort of aberrations we should get, get rid of. We wouldn't be better off without them. Rather, they're complex motivational systems, uh, uh, evolved to solve problems, sensitive to the, to the culture, exquisitely crafted to deal with the natural and social environments that we live in.